Very happy to be moderating a panel on alternative finance today. Um, we have quite a bit to cover, so I think that we'll just jump right in. Um, alternative finance is a little bit of a vague term, which can mean quite a few different things. So I would ask my panelists to introduce themselves, let us know um, what sort of products their lending platform offers, and um, tell us a little bit about how it's different from other sort of lending platforms. And maybe we can start with Hans. If you could just let us know a little bit about Soul Shipping and how it differs from other leasing houses. Hello? Yeah. So basically what we do is we do sale leasebacks on the bareboat basis. We have a defined exit, usually sort of five to seven year term. We buy all sorts of ships from modern VLCCs to older LPG vessels. So our business is counterparty focused. We look at the counterparty and thereafter we assess the asset. But the primary, primary reason for doing the business is the counterparty. We uh, try to follow our clients through high and lows. And we've been successful in doing repeat business with our clients for the last 15 years. Currently, we have 32 ships, probably market value of them, $700 million. We've recently raised funds for a new fund. We've closed the first closing at $150 million and hope to raise another $100 million within the next three or four months. Great, thank you. Uh, so, Nino, what does your platform offer? Are there particular uh, deal structures or deal sizes that you are, are most interested in? Yeah, so Breakwater Capital <clears throat> is a platform dedicated to maritime finance. We, in the last five years, have invested north of $2.5 billion. Uh, the vast majority of that capital has been invested in the form of senior secured first lien debt. Uh, and I'd say that what, differenti what differentiates us from Solar Shipping is that we, more often than not, are very much focused on the asset first and foremost. Uh, this is not credit lending, it's not corporate lending. Uh, we market ourselves as asset-focused lenders, uh, as project finance lenders, as lenders who step in to provide tailored solutions more often than not when banks are not able to act, when asset coverage is healthy, when you can build conviction very quickly that 50, 60, 65, even 70, 75% leverage makes sense today, historically, and also versus replacement cost equivalent. Um, but then the difficult discussions come around uh, underwriting cash flows and what the drivers and the catalysts are that are going to improve or maintain cash flows throughout the transaction. Um, so usually we are operating at our best when markets are challenging and when owners need a quick solution, a creative solution, a tailored, structured amortization profile. Great, thank you. And Milland, we will uh, be able to witness uh, what Yield Street does in a little bit, but why don't you give us a little bit of an introduction? Sure. So uh, my name is Milind Harry. I'm the founder and CEO of Yield Street. Yield Street is an investment platform that is changing how wealth is created. So we are a little bit different than just typically a funding organization. On one side, we have investors here in the United States that don't have access to non-correlated asset-based investments. And on the other side, we provide them that access across many industries, Yield Street Marine Finance being one of them. So we started Yield Street Marine Finance about uh, a year and a half ago, and we've done uh, close to $200 million in transactions. And our focus really has been on mortgage-based loans, sales and leasebacks, and then we also do revolvable facilities for uh, deconstruction. And uh, I've been really excited about how, uh, how the team has evolved. Uh, we have an office in Athens, uh, uh, led by George Kambanis that many of you might uh, know. And uh, so the, the thesis really is on one side you have investors uh, and, and what I'm going to show you today is how they get access to this asset-based investments. The platform has been around for four years. We have uh, over 250,000 investors on the platform that have uh, invested uh, close to $1.1 billion through the platform. Um, and uh, and you, uh, we're going to show you how the platform actually works in a, in a few minutes. Excited to be here. Great, thank you. So I guess uh, my next question has to do with whether or not, and I guess I'll, I'll target Nino for this, 
Um, if you feel that you are um, kind of working with traditional shipping banks to narrow the funding gap, or if alternative finance lenders are really um, in competition with traditional shipping banks uh, for, for deals and for borrowers. Okay. I suppose for me it depends on the perspective or the lens you're viewing it from. If you look at it from an industry perspective, we seek to partner with ship owners. We seek to put sustainable structures in place. When we put a loan out the door, it's a five-year loan or a seven-year loan, and we focus on the break-evens that are sustainable even in a challenging market environment. I think that a lot of all other alternative lenders will look at markets and structured products with high leverage and high fixed coupons, and you have basically an implied bridge product. We are in many ways the opposite, where we will extract economics in the form of balanced upfront fees, balanced exit uh, prepayment penalties, and then lower uh, spreads, lower margins to help an owner withstand a challenging environment. Um, there have been several instances where we've worked hand in glove with uh, mainstream banks to get deals done. Uh, many of those have been publicly traded companies uh, here in New York, also in Oslo. Um, ticket sizes ranging from as small as 20 million and then as large as 350 million. Uh, we never syndicate out our loans, so if a borrower does come to us and work with us, they're doing that because they choose to work with us. They understand that we're not flitting from German retail crisis or Spanish real estate crisis or American subprime. Maritime is all we do. Uh, and we live and breathe it, and we speak the same language as the borrowers. And I think the banks are receptive to that because there are companies that deserve appropriate capital, and there are projects that deserve appropriate capital, and we work at times, not against, but there are times that simply because the bank's risk models require cash flow, they cannot lend, so we will step in. And we expect that within the confines of reality, you're gonna be refied when the markets improve and banks step back in. Uh, that's all part of the game. All right, Han, same question. Do you look at yourself as being in competition with traditional shipping banks or really working with them? I think we mainly work with them because we usually back leverage and uh, leverage our ships with uh, the traditional banks. And we also fill a gap where we do older tonnage so we can <coughs> do all equity deals. So I think it's, uh, it's a friendly competition on some, and then main, but mainly it's together with the, the traditional banks. So Milan, what, what type of borrower are you looking for when you are uh, trying to figure out whether or not to go forward with a deal? Are there particular parameters that Yield Street has? And are those parameters, are any of them intangibles, such as reputation, relationship, or are they mostly just business parameters? Yeah, so I think the way we look at it is uh, some of the points already mentioned here. I think for us, the most important factor is who the borrower is and what is the asset. And what is the asset uh, and how is that asset going to pay us back? At the end of the day, our focus is to make sure that we structure a transaction where the borrower is able to make money through the transaction because only then we feel that, uh, you know, that deal is structured properly for us to get our money back. Uh, we also work in the area where it's mostly situational finance, right? So some of the points that were mentioned earlier, such as older ships, so we could write, underwrite to scrap value, for example. In three years, uh, whatever is the value of the vessel, we could recover it through scrap. Uh, the other thing we do is that banks won't uh, lend more than 40, 50% LTV, so we could do the top 20% on, on, on top of that. Um, so we are really trying to play where, uh, you know, the efficiency of capital is not there. And uh, our thesis is that we want to uh, uh, provide the right type of uh, um, yield to the borrower that makes it profitable for them. And then ultimately, yeah, the, if the situation improves both for the borrower or for the market, we are very happy if the bank uh, uh, comes in and refinances us out or they find a cheaper source of capital. Uh, so I think this is where I think it's a win-win situation for us. And you know, a lot of people look at alternative finance as being a more expensive, more pricey way of getting financing. Um, but I have heard alternative finance lenders say that really when they look at the whole picture, alternative finance products may be less expensive than those offered by traditional banks. And I was wondering what your thoughts are on that. We have to uh, move to our launch very quickly, so maybe we can just kind of go down the, the row with Melinda starting with you, and, and you can let us know your thoughts on, on that. Yeah, so I think uh, alternative finance is obviously going to be uh, 
more expensive than traditional financing. Just take an example here, right? If you are a prime borrower in the United States looking for a home mortgage, you are essentially getting, depending upon the type of mortgage, anything from 250 basis points to 350 basis points. But if you are an uh, independent contractor, that goes twice that amount of money. So I think uh, for us, uh, uh, where we play again is where efficiency of capital is not there. Older vessels, uh, more leverage than traditionally allowed by banks, and uh, time to market is uh, really important. That's where we play, and we hope uh, to get paid for that risk. So generally the areas, or, or the areas that we look at is uh, around L plus 600, and so uh, leverage is another area where banks might offer you money at L200, and then uh, we might bridge that. So the blended cost to the ship owners or borrowers is again in, in, a, in a reasonable realm um, for them to actually uh, do well with the business. Great, okay, Hans, for you, high risk, high price, is that uh, what, what goes on at sole shipping or? Uh... Well, I think the blended cost is, is competitive if you think about it because you have back leverage with bank finance, but then you put one slice in, which is equity, and you can compare it to either raising equity or doing a, an unsecured, unsecured bond. So I think at the, at the end of the day, it is competitive, and for us, it's a question of getting consistent long-term returns on our equity. So we try to follow the market, and uh, I think our clients feel that um, the cost of funds for them is uh, in line with what they would get elsewhere. No. I, I think that it's about an appropriate balance of risk and reward. Uh, the, I think the fastest, thanks to Reed Smith, Amanda, not to plug you guys, but... Um, uh, we'll take it. The, yeah, the fastest that we have turned around a deal from the first phone call to drawdown of capital is two weeks. And I don't think there's a lot of mainstream financial institutions simply as a function of risk models and committees and KYC and AML, all of which we do, but we do it within the confines of a GPLP structure, enables us to move incredibly quickly. Okay, people will pay for that. Uh, that means that they get the deal done. Uh, one and two, as I said earlier, we step into situations where cash flow is challenging, where we can put in place a two-year cash sweep in lieu of hard amor. We can put in place pick instead of hard interest. So there are flexible creative structural elements that are arguably worth paying for. Uh, and, and clearly, two and a half billion dollars later, uh, people do pay for it and, and people get deals done. And as I said, over time, they refi us and, and, and they move on with the next step of their corporate growth. Okay, great. I have some follow-up questions, but I will pause and I will, I will cede the floor to Milind if you want to uh, take over for your launch. Okay, great. So could we uh, get the screen up here? So obviously this is uh, real time happening at 4 p.m. Eastern time. What you see here is our platform. Uh, and uh, what we're launching at 4 o'clock is an investment uh, uh, in our art finance business. So uh, it's a $10.5 million investment. And as you can see, 100% of it is remaining. The minimum investment is uh, uh, Ten thousand dollars, and you can see the terms and things like that. And uh, this is not investing in art; it is obviously lending against an art portfolio. So uh, we work with uh, auction houses, galleries, and high net worth individual uh, that might have art that's sitting in. So it's almost like uh, mortgaging your uh, real estate asset, if you will. Um, so uh, in, it's going to launch in about two minutes, and uh, we will see what happens. The way the process works is we would have sent an email out to our investor community. Uh, three, four days in advance with all the materials. So they have had a chance to look at the investment, look at uh, why we like the investment, all the details of the investment. And uh, what they're going to do now is just come in and choose how much uh, money they want to put uh, into, into this investment. So uh, we, we will see. Um, it's, a couple minutes. it's probably a minute. This is 10.25. 10.25 million. I, so I personally invest on the platform. Uh, we don't, as a company, uh, hold any uh, uh, this thing, any uh, investment. But we personally, as founders and management team, does money. I'm going to, in fact, try and uh, see if I can get in. Uh, I get in at the same time as uh, everybody else. So. So it's 3:59. So it's going to 
what here you will see is uh, out of the 10.25 million, how much is getting subscribed as, uh, as things, uh, things move. And what sort of investors can participate in this? So these are uh, US uh, accredited investors at this point, which is uh, somebody that makes uh, $200,000 of net income. There are about uh, 13 million people in the U United States. So we're open only to the accredited investor population. Yes, they could, but they have to do it at the same time. But we don't really have financial advisors. Oh, there you go. Wow. You have to get in on this. I know. It's pretty wild, huh? It's pretty wild. <laughs> That's it. It's about 470. Sorry, I got so nervous kind of looking at all this. I, I, I couldn't complete my own uh, thing. Uh, <laughs> So there you have it, guys, uh, 470 investors, 11.725. Uh, so, thank you. Thank you very much. Crazy. That sold out faster than uh, yes. a Lady Gaga concert I was trying to uh, <laughs> like I was gonna put my get into, um, which is pretty impressive, because that sold out pretty quickly, too. Um, okay, wow. So I guess, you know, this was for an art financing, but I understand that Yield Street Marine Financing, of course, focuses on, on vessels and, and, you know, um, the idea is that accredited investors, I assume, would be, um, you know, registered members of Yield Street and everything would be done online, essentially. Right. It's a tech right. platform. Yep, that's exactly right. And also one thing to note here is that we have already closed this on our balance sheet. So we have a balance sheet. So there is no execution risk to the borrower. So we are not saying, hey, we are going to rely on our investor base to come into the table. We already close it and we take the distribution risk. So this is sitting on our balance sheet and we, then we put it out uh, on the platform. So that's, I think, important to mention. So uh, the, we have a management fee. It uh, depends on the transaction, but here it would be probably between, uh, on an average, at about 1.5%. That's it. And all the fees are transparent on the platform, um, and users know about them. Great. Well, thank you for that. That was uh, pretty impressive. Um, I guess we touched on exit strategy a little bit um, before, and I guess you know some, something that borrowers and uh, would be interested in to know is what is the exit strategy behind your platforms? Are you looking to be refinanced very quickly? Um, are you looking for some other sort of exit strategy? Um, so maybe Nino, can you walk us through? Yeah, as I said, we, we do not deploy bridge capital. Um, I'd say 99% of our products are five years and longer. It's very patient money. I did catch a brief glimpse of the panel before and I think I heard one of the investors say that he had one to two year money I would argue that it's incredibly dangerous to deploy such short-term capital into a cyclical long-term uh, industry. I think that that's how uh, investors have been burned in this industry. I think that's how uh, you more often than not may be forced to sell at the bottom, um, especially if your investors have short-term call periods and you don't have a long lockup or a closed-end fund. Um, so our capital is meant to be sustainable. We are incredibly focused on sustainable break-evens, even when you're stress testing the cash flows. Um, yeah. Okay, Hans, you're, you have a little bit more of a, a long-term investment as well. What are, what are your thoughts on this? Typically five to seven years, and we have in place put call structures, so uh, the counterparty can call before, t before the end of the tenor. In case the market goes up or they want to exit for some reason, they used to call. If it goes to the end, then we have a put. So we can put the vessel back to the counterparty. So, Milland, I think that Yield Street may have a different type of philosophy when it comes to timing and term. What, what, what is Yield Street's kind of preferred exit strategy for their deals? Yeah, so I think uh, for us, uh, we are very focused on the, the, the borrower and the, and the ship owner and how can we be a good par partner to them. So we definitely have flexibility. We can uh, you know, do, we usually do less than four years. 
but the but I agree with Nico. I think the only thing that we do short term is generally for uh, either deconstruction or for some very specific uh, use of proceeds, where you need the money to buy, you know, make a cash buy on on a, on a ship that is going to the scrapyard. Uh, rest of our transactions are three years with extensions built in. We have the ability for people to pay back or to extend. Uh, but the idea for us is that we are not looking for. Uh, uh, very, very long-term capital, but capital that is enough for uh, us to feel comfortable with uh, where the asset and broadly the industry is going, and then we try to be flexible uh, with, the, with the borrower and their needs. So it seems like, of course, all of you are, you know, very committed to uh, your platforms and shipping. Um, I know Hans, Soul Shipping has been around for, for since 2004, I believe it is. Um, I think that sometimes people look at, um, alternative finance providers as uh, people who are involved in an industry for the short term, maybe to um, get what they can out of the industry and work in a cyclical way, and then leave the industry. What are, uh, I saw, I'll start with you, Hans. Um, what is, is there a growth strategy at Soul Shipping? Are you in this in the long term? We've been there for 15 years, and we will remain in the industry at least for the next 15 years. Um, we had a pause between 2008 and 2011 because vessel values were too high, so we felt it was the wrong time to, to, to do the business. So in that respect, we are careful, but we want to be, and we've just recently started raising funds in uh, our next fund, so we closed at $150 million last week and hope to raise a further $100 million within Q1 2020 so that we're ready to do more business. And Milland, how about you? I know that Yield Street Marine Finance is pretty new, maybe around a year old. What, is there a particular growth strategy that, that Yield Street Marine Finance employs? Uh, do you guys look at shipping as a long-term prospect? Yeah, for sure. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have an office in Athens, and uh, we have George Kambanis, who's been in the shipping industry for 40 years. Our chief credit officer is uh, Stefanos Fargos, who was at DVB Bank. Some of you might know him for the last 16 years. And so we have a deep commitment. We have looked at, uh, since we started, $1.5 billion of transactions to do the $200 uh, million that we have done uh, on the platform. I think we are very unique in the sense that we don't have committed capital per se, but we have on-demand capital. And so what that does is puts us in a very different scenario. So it's, uh, we can dial up if we think that there is opportunity that's right for our investor base and could invest 500 million in the next year. But if we feel that uh, there are not the right opportunity for us, we could dial down and not do the deal. So in the first six months, we did almost 150 million. Last six months, we did only about $40 million. And now we have a pipeline between now and end of the year of uh, over 200 million that we are going to put up on, the, on, on, our, on our platform. So I think that makes us very different from a traditional fund uh, model, uh, where what we could do is, depending upon broadly our view on the industry and the opportunities that are presented to us, we could dial up, dial down the commitment that we have. Uh, but uh, ultimately, the reason for us to build the Athens office and uh, to have a really talented team there is to demonstrate our uh, commitment to the shipping industry broadly, and we'll continue to expand that. You know, Nico knows that you know, he's been there from day one, and, and uh, you know, we've, uh, we've been really uh, uh, committed and steadfast on that. You know, growth strategy or short-term position? Um, <clears throat> growth strategy is keep doing what we're doing. I think right now it's fair to say it's about managing risk. Uh, it's incredibly difficult to justify lending into uh, tanker markets, given where they are today. Uh, uh, we have a dedicated team in place, and, and we're definitely not going anywhere. Uh, it's, it's, it's resource intensive. We process a, a large pipeline on an annual basis of north of 10 billion per year, and we're executing on four to 600 million. So we're sorting, um, uh, it's resource intensive, you know, picking the winners uh, from, from the pipeline. And, uh, and making sure that uh, you allocate capital uh, appropriately. So it, it is research uh, and, and resource intensive. And I guess one of the questions is, why do your platforms favor providing financing as opposed to getting involved on in the equity side of deals? And, and Nina, we'll start with you. 
Well, the easy answer is it's not our mandate. So we don't have a mandate to invest in public common equity. Um, I'd say the more nuanced answer is that on a risk-adjusted basis, if you look historically, and I think it was DNB on the banking panel this morning who argued that the ROE over 30, 40-year period through several cycles uh, is in the order of high single digits from an equity perspective. Um, if you compare that to the types of returns you're able to achieve uh, from a senior secured perspective, uh, if you're able to underwrite the assets, if you understand the markets, if you understand the quality of your borrowers and their track record, um, then on a risk-adjusted basis, I think that the credit returns are pretty compelling for investors. Han, same, same query. Well, I think, you know, we, we also invest equity because we back leverage, so we call it equity, but it's more like a credit strategy, and we've found that that is what gives us a consistent long-term return. And it gives us a, a long-term return at the level where our clients can actually pay the bevel rates that give that return. So it, it works, the model works, and our investors seem to be happy, happy with the dividends that we pay. So overall, it's, uh, we find it to be in the shipping industry from an equity perspective, we find that is the best, best place to be. Milind? I think for us, uh, if you take, uh, take a step back and look at our investment thesis, we clearly state that we want to look at um, non-correlated or low-correlated assets, uh, and we can achieve that through structure or, or other uh, nuances. We look for asset backed with good collateral that generates cash flow. And so, uh, and then finally, we want to work with good borrowers and originators that bring us those transactions. So we feel that uh, the credit strategies that we have embarked on in shipping, and which I, I said is flexible and evolves, is the right strategy for our investors who are expecting, you know, kind of monthly or quarterly dividends. And uh, hence, we think that you know, it's a strong way for us to uh, kind of partner and expand in shipping, and that's what uh, we have been focused on. Okay, great. So the, the, the concept of industry disruptors, it's a little bit of a buzzword um, that's been used uh, in, with respect to the shipping industry recently. And I was wondering, especially with respect to Hans and Nino with your more long-term uh, deals, how these kind of advances in technology and um, different environmental types of regulations, if any of those factor into how you structure your deals or whether or not to go forward with a deal. So Nino, why don't we start with you? Yeah. Uh, so we are able to lend against old assets. We are comfortable taking sc scrap or scrap related exposure. We have recently closed a transaction on uh, three older VLs in the order of 19 years of age with scrap coverage day one. I think that that paradigm is changing and, and we are forced to pay more attention to those, as you put it, disruptors, whether it be uh, propulsion technology or emission standards. Uh, I think that the green agenda, the carbon agenda is here to stay. I think it's here to stay from a regulatory perspective and I think it's here to stay from a cultural perspective. Uh, and I don't think we should underestimate the impact of the cultural perspective in the sense that, albeit it may be the younger generation who are out there protesting on the streets, uh, they're going to be the wallet in 20 years. And if you order a tanker today, uh, that thing's going to be around and that thing's going to be transporting what they're consuming. Um, I think that the statistic that BP released was that uh, a ban on single-use plastics could erode as much as 4% of, uh, of uh, oil demand. Uh, so when you start to weigh up all of those types of statistics, it does look like the landscape could be profoundly changed within the next 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, it's not an easy question, but yes, definitely goes into the underwriting. Hans? Well, we think it's difficult to, to, to make decisions today on if our clients want to do new buildings because these are ships that will be delivered sometime ahead of us and it's going to last for 20, 25 years. And a lot is going to happen over the next 10, 15 years. So we are actually taking comfort in the fact that we can also do older vessels. We recently did the 20-year-old LPGs for a five-year deal, so it's this is manageable within what we can probably analyze today. And if we do 10-year-old vessel, okay, it's 15 years life, but maybe you have a repayment profile that's a bit quicker than 15 years. So 
the really modern ships is uh, becoming more and more difficult, we think, to, to, to finance because you don't know what they will be, whether they are prepared for the long-term future. Milan, is this something that, that comes into play at all in, in, in Yellow Street Marine Finance's uh, decisions? Yeah, I think uh, I have a slightly different view, which is I think obviously being a technology company and living in the digital world and you saw uh, generally kind of the interaction on the platform of how we are thinking about uh, connecting the asset management industry uh, in general to kind of the investment wealth management industry. For us, technology always has been a, a critical ethos of who we are. For our business to work, Technology and data is critical, and we do that, uh, we use that heavily in our underwriting models and kind of predicting the outcomes of the portfolios. And uh, on the other side, we also use that to make sure that we have the right data on the types of transactions we do, whether it's in real estate or in, or in shipping, uh, or in art as an example. Uh, we have uh, 75 years of auction data available in the market. Once you start aggregating that data, you get signals on how this would evolve in the next year or two. So we continuously try to look at that and use that uh, when, we, when it comes to underwriting and other important things uh, on the platform. Great, so speaking of uh, looking at historical facts and trying to predict the future, um, I would be interested to hear how we're, now that 2019 is almost at its end, how this year kind of met your expectations or didn't meet your expectations, um, and if you have any predictions for 2020 and alternative finance or your, your particular platform. So, Nino, what do you think? Any predictions? Predictions? <laughs> predictions. I'm not sure if it's a prediction, but I would say I am impressed by the way the liner companies and the alliances of the liner companies in the container market have played this market so well to their advantage. If you take a step back and you look at the marginal tonnage provider, especially within the feeder asset classes, they are squeezed, they are price takers. The utilization in that market is incredibly high, but the short-term fixtures are constantly rolling, which means that the liner companies essentially have all the power. Um, it's an incredibly difficult market dynamic, and the buzzword in this industry is consolidation, and, and the consolidation in this instance has happened on the other side of the table. It's a very dangerous paradigm. Um, other predictions, uh, I'm not going to give predictions, but I'd say that what's interesting is clearly the fact that we're sitting here today in, uh, in an environment within tankers that I don't think anybody expected simply as a function of tariffs and, and regulatory standards, simply not as a, a direct driver of fundamentals. Um, and how long that will last is, is anyone's guess. Hans, how has 2019 treated soul shipping and what are your thoughts for the future? Well, 2019 has been a good year. We've uh, bought a lot of ships and with the counterparties that we, of course, like. And we are prepared for 2020 with uh, cash to do so that we can do more business. A um, bit worrisome with the tanker market going so high as it's done, so we'll have to see how that market pans out before we buy more tankers, but we are ready to do, to do business with our clients. And I Milan, this has probably been a pretty exciting year considering marine finance is so young. Why don't you let us know how 2019 has been and what you see for the future? Yeah, I think uh, we're very excited where we are. I think uh, we probably have uh, you know, a couple hundred million dollars of deals to do for the rest of the year, speaking specifically about kind of transaction volume. I think next year we are looking to uh, invest between 400 and 500 million across various different strategies. Uh, tankers has been like a very interesting and fast trade that changed uh, pretty dramatically in the last six months for us. We were super interested in it. And uh, though we haven't really pulled a, a major um, trade there, uh, the market has really moved very quickly and has uh, the asset values have really uh, uh, become very expensive. So we'll continue to um, track those and continue to kind of come up with strategies that we feel uh, provides uh, risk-adjusted returns to our, to our investors. So excited uh, for, for what 2020 uh, brings and uh, also how all this uh, regulation in Q1 is ultimately going to shake out because uh, you know, that's, uh, that's a big kind of question mark as we come out of Q1 and like, see what, what actually happens. So, uh, so, uh, so we'll, we'll keep a close eye on it.
Great, thank you. Well, that is all the time that we have. I want to thank our panelists for uh, joining us today. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Thanks very much. <laughs>